So we're going to bring up Boaz now to say a few words. Uh, but if you joined right at the top of the hour, we had three trivia questions up on screen. And thanks to our teammate, Ben, for putting those together. And to Jessica for building that cool slide with the questions and timer. We're really upping the production. So appreciate all the hard work that goes into that. Um, so Jessica is going to post the questions in the chat so everyone can see them in case you missed them. And I'll share the answer to the first question now. And the question was, in plants, the original PV panel, what is the green pigment essential for absorbing energy from the sun? And the answer is chlorophyll. And it's a molecule made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and magnesium. Um, and there are two more trivia questions in the chat window, so we're learning a lot already today. Boaz, thank you for joining us. Uh, Boaz is going to say a few words and go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jessica, I was totally impressed with that intro slide as well. I'm, I'm, uh, every week, we, we take it up a notch. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about um, software. Uh, and whenever we um, have a meeting about software, um, we tend to talk about solutions a lot. So I wanted to give a little context, because I think it's really important that as solar contractors are looking for software solutions, that they also keep in mind um, the environment in which digital transformation can um, really be cultivated. Um, and, and I think of that as creating a digital culture or, or um, a culture of digital transformation. And that really means being digital, or it could mean being agile as opposed to doing digital. And being digital um, really speaks to culture consisting of values, beliefs, and behaviors. And really at a, at a beliefs level is where our mindsets need to evolve in order to create a context for successful um, digital transformation. Um, so, so I'm just going to share a couple of mindset changes. These come from a McKinsey article on agile transformation, but I think it's totally relevant for digital transformation as well. And Jessica is going to share the link to this McKinsey article. Um, they publish a ton of super useful content um, on, on this topic. Um, so some of the mindsets, and I'll, I'll summarize, they go into a lot more detail, but one is... Um, uh, uh, valuing collaboration over competition. Then we have empowering people over directing them. Embracing uncertainty over making detailed long-term plans. And seeing technology as the core to every aspect of the organization um, in order to unlock value, as opposed to seeing technology as a supporting capability. Um, so you can see how if, if we have a core value of innovation, for example, but we don't change our mindset from valuing collaboration, um, I'm sorry, to valuing collaboration over valuing competition, then we can really miss the mark. We can value innovation, but not put the mindsets in place in our organizations that actually get us towards different results um, than we have today. So I just want to, wanted to set that context about uh, our mindsets changing as we're thinking about solutions and how we're approaching our own digital transformations. Um, so I'm sure that'll come up more during the conversation. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you to our panelists for being here and to our attendees and Tom and Jessica. I'm super excited for today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Boaz. Uh, appreciate those thoughts. So before we bring up our guests, I'd like to mention that if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A. We did receive quite a few questions in advance, and we're going to get to most of them. Uh, but Jessica is going to put a few extras in the chat. She actually can't put them in the Q&A herself. So you can uh, copy and paste those into the Q&A if, like uh, if you'd like us to tackle those, and then folks can upvote them as we go. So I'd like to bring up our guest today, um, and we've got five wonderful guests. And from the solar contractors side of the conversation, we have Joe Marhamati from Ipsen, and we'll bring him up on screen. Joe, great to see you. Thank you for joining us again. 
Um, and we have J.W. Peters. He's the president of Solar Power of Oklahoma. This is his first time on the podcast. Welcome, J.W. Glad you could join us. On the solar software side of things, we have Scott Wynn. He's the CEO of 17 Terawatts and their solar so uh, software product, Bodhi. Welcome back, Scott. Great to have you again. And we have Jan Rippengale, the CEO of Blue Banyan Solutions and their product, Solar Success. Thanks for joining us, Jan. We've worked with you in the past. Great to have you back. And we have Colton Main. He's the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Solo. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. And Jessica is going to add the company links uh, in the chat as well. Um, so you can check out those organizations as we go. So I want to kick off the conversation today from the contractor perspective. And I want to talk about the place where many solar contractors find themselves at one point or, or another in their organizational growth. Uh, and that's the point when you realize you might need to reevaluate your company's approach to, to solar software. And JW, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. Um, you went to SBI in 2019, and you mentioned you were looking around at the solar software vendors, and you were searching for that one solution, you know, that silver bullet, you know, um, trying to put out of your mind where you are now, because you, you've gone down a road, you've had lots of conversations, and you're starting to, to build your solar infrastructure. But thinking back um, to where you were at SPI, um, what what was the point you were at when you realized you needed to reevaluate your, your solar software? And, and what was that one solution that you had in your mind? So I, I kind of found myself literally recreating the will and um, managing all of my processes through a series of Excel spreadsheets all tied together and trying to get that to integrate, integrate with my um, CRM getting it integrated with my accounting software and just really trying to be able to kind of have that one solution. And so I, I just assumed going to SBI that we were going to find it. I just assumed that it was there. We were just going to run into it and we were going to have multiple options. I didn't know um, what it was going to look like, whether it was going to be an operational software that paired with our CRM and paired with accounting. Um, but I, I, it was, it was just one of those things where I just, I thought that the solution was already out there. And I just went looking for it, and I was surprised to find that there that there wasn't one that just kind of like hit me in the face. Right, Joe, um, I'd like to bounce over to you as our other contractor rep on the show. Um, what what resonated with you from what JW just said? You know, um, and was your company aligned from the beginning with a solar software strategy in mind, or did you take a staged approach? You know, um, walk us through your your software story at Ipsen. Well, uh, we also had a web of spreadsheets. Uh, we called it Icarus. It was the name of our uh, master spreadsheet with 20 tabs that tied everything together and solved all our problems uh, until we got to our 101st customer and said, this isn't going to work forever, is it? Um, so that's when we started to look at other solutions. So I think scalability for us is the reason that we're always trying to stay one step ahead on software. Because even if the cost of a new piece of software is more than what we might be spending to do the same thing today, we're looking at where we want to be in three years, where we want to be in five years, and if it's going to help us get there faster, more efficiently, make our people happier, make our customers happier, then we know it's a good investment. So that's when we started to look at Solar Success, that's when we started to look at Bodhi, uh, as well as a whole other host of software uh, platforms. Okay, great. Chan, I'd like to bounce over to you, um, and I'm going to ask Jessica to share a slide because I think it, it gets to the heart of a lot of uh, some of the troubles that we run into um, when we think about solar software. And uh, Jan, can you walk us through this slide, please? I, I think it's informative for the conversation. Uh, what, what is the hairball? And you might be muted. I can't tell. Yes. There we go. There we go. So the, the hairball is where most solar installer companies are starting and they've got basic accounting and project management and they're trying to tie it together literally with, you know, this cascade of, of wires. And because installers are so um, resourceful, there is often a lot of complex connections that happen between these hairballs. But typically accounting is siloed. And what that means is that because you don't want to show all of your accounting information 
with the systems, you end up hiding the information or requiring someone to be like a gateway person who's going to tell you, did that invoice get paid or did this happen or did that happen? And it, it creates a bottleneck around accounting. Then when you have incompatible applications, like maybe CAD and other programs that were built for single desktops and PCs back way back when, then you can't, how do you get that bill of materials information into your purchasing? And so you just create these situations where you've got multiple data sources for things and various different interfaces that you, that you need to learn. And so the amount of knowledge that you need to learn to actually organize and run everything is, is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And this is working. People are actually making this work for a certain level, but the, where we'd like to see everybody shift and what we think is going to help the industry grow by reducing the soft costs, all the things to actually make get solar deployed quickly is going to be more of a single data source where you effectively have the experience of a single source of truth. Mm -hmm. The accounting has to be the foundation. You, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel on accounting because it is core to how everything works, but you need to do it in such a way that you've got permissions so you can show who's going to see what, when, that kind of thing. Right. And so solar success is a layer on top of NetSuite because they enabled us to have the accounting database and we could just extend it. So we're literally referencing the exact same tables that you have in your accounting system. Yeah, that's great. Um, Jessica, if you would stop that slide share. Thanks, Jan, for that overview. And I think that that hairball, you know, that that mess of um, different types of software that are, you know, tangling together, you know, I think you mentioned contractors are resourceful. That is that is very true. You know, the solar industry is resourceful, figuring out these things, but you do hit that wall. So that's that that's like the contractor perspective. That's what a lot of people are dealing with. Scott, I'd like to bounce over to you and let's look at what the customer sees. You know, um, you stressed to us before, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, the Amazon influence uh, on the customer experience, you know, and you've tied that to the customer experience. Can you flesh that out for us a, a little more? Um, maybe what the expectations are and then, you know, maybe define for us that new solar customer. Build us that profile. Yeah, for sure. And so, I mean, when you start thinking about it first, I mean, the solar industry, we're moving away from those early adopters to more of the mass consumer. And so that's who we call this new solar consumer. I mean, this is like your neighbor, Ned, who knows that going solar is a good choice, but keeping track of energy is just not a priority. But the key thing that's most important for solar installers, solar contractors and companies to really understand is that neighbor Ned, I mean, he lives in this, what we call the age of Amazon. And with that, he expects that their information and their services all need to be on demand at the top of his fingers. He's also expecting that all his interactions with the company to be hyper-personalized. Otherwise, he's just not going to pay attention. Um, but fortunately, one of the other things is he's moved away kind of from these, this transactional approach of buying something and forgetting about it, but now expecting really constant value from the purchases that he does make. And so... For us, as more and more products and services do become available to the consumer, that becomes a big opportunity for us in the, in the solar industry. And so that's exactly why we built Bodhi to really try to meet and hopefully you know, exceed that, those expectations of what we're calling the new solar consumer. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd like to get to an audience question, and this is uh, one from Jason C. Um, nice to hear from you, Jason. And he asks, what are the best tools for sales generation? And, and Colton, I want to bounce over here to you, you know, and I think all organizations are looking for ways to make sales more seamless. Um, how is Solo approaching that sales enablement process? You know, and if, you know, if for the audience, if they don't use Solo, you know, can you give any tips um, about the best way to leverage software in the sales process in general? Yeah, great question. I'll kind of echo some of the things that Scott and others have shared. The consumer today is very familiar with technology through their purchasing experiences. Um, and something we've done at Solo is just simplified that process of presenting savings, finance options, um, all within one really smooth tool. Um, 
makes it super easy for the contractors and sales team members to use and the smoother it is for them to go through the sales process, then the easier it is for the customer to say yes. So it's very familiar um, to kind of this Amazon consumer, you know, they're able to see what they're looking for. Um, it looks good. It's very attractive. And then they're able to go through the steps to make the purchase very easily. Mm -hmm. um, JW, can, can we go back to, you know, what you were talking about as you were, you were uh, hitting a wall and you were trying to redefine the wheel all of that time. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about where you are now and how um, you, your work with Jan and, and other companies has, re, has influenced your approach? Yeah, so for us, we, we knew that it was going to be um, an expense that we, that we weren't really kind of taking on right now. But we also um, were looking to the future to see kind of what that looks like and how can we expand and be able to be agile to be able to grow as fast as what we thought that we were going to need to be able to grow. So making that upfront investment uh, was, was good for us. But, um, but yeah, now, now we can really kind of see everything in real time. And I don't have to spend my evenings and weekends creating spreadsheets or updating spreadsheets manually to be able to mine the data that I need to be able to make real world decisions on my business, um, you know, on demand. Mm -hmm. Jan, I'd like to bounce over to you. And, you know, you talked about when we chatted last week about how very small incremental changes can make a huge difference, you know, in aggregate. Can you talk about that a little bit? Cause I think that goes back to Boaz's point about the, the mindset, the mind shift. We can't expect one thing to do everything. We need to take a more systematized approach maybe, or do you agree with that? I, I do think we should have a, a systemized systematized approach in that we should have it just, we do need interoperability so that we don't end up siloed. And that's actually a, a longer conversation. The process of making continuous improvements, the first step in any time that you're going to enable continuous improvements is you have to actually have your starting process, right? So the, the first step that you do is we, we set up these project templates so that you know what all the steps are in your process. And that in and of itself, just that clarity of definition helps scale businesses tremendously. But then once you've got that in place, pretty soon, since we're all kind of lazy and things get tedious pretty quickly, it becomes clear that when you're working on plans, if they've got, you know, a recently built home that you've seen in this neighborhood before, maybe you don't need to go out and do a specific site survey for them because you actually do know all the information that you need. And you start to be able to see opportunities where you can just put things on the happy path and streamline it through rather than making sure that you have to go through every single step in every single case because one case somewhere required all the steps, but not every case actually does. So you start to be able to skip steps where you don't need it. And, and then managing by exception where you only have bring in the humans to think about a problem if it is actually a complex problem if it's mundane and rote and you kind of know where it's supposed to go based on the fact it's a neighborhood you know, then you actually just fast track it and move it through the pipeline more quickly. And each of these tweaks into your process, because you've defined the process to begin with, then you start to be able to tweak it to know, you know, 40% of the time I can just skip this step and I was still gonna have the equal quality outcome. Mm -hmm. And it, it reduces your overhead and it increases job satisfaction, right? Because the, what the people are doing is the interesting stuff that they should actually be thinking about. Well, as I, to, what resonates with you from that? You know, we, we've talked a lot about, I think continual improvement is a big factor here, but not reinventing the wheel, like trying to identify that solution and go for it. What, what resonates with you? Well, I, I completely agree with with what Jan is saying about continual improvement that, you know, starting with a process um, and then iterating it um, is uh, how, how a lot of us um, drive change in the business. Um, there are a couple of things that we've noticed about continual improvement though. And, and as Jan said, this becomes a longer conversation, um, but, but it has its challenges. For, for example, 
what JW is talking about, um, moving away from uh, really complex spreadsheets and manual entry to an integrated solution, that's not a, a continual improvement. That's a disruptive change to the organization, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's probably a change that's affecting every department across the organization to some degree. Um, once that's in place, then continual improvement um, can take place. So there, there are two different scales of change happening concurrently when we talk about digital transformation. And those disruptions are not necessarily one-time events. Um, the, the change that JW made to his business, um, I'm, I'm sure JW doesn't want to hear this, but in, in two years, three years, five years, there might be another um, change of, of a similar scale that, that needs to happen as the, the environment that we're participating in becomes more complex, as our businesses become more complex. So I think there, there are two main challenges with continual improvement. One is um, it tends to happen in, in departments. Um, no matter how we organize our companies, we end up with silos of some kind. Um, and so continual improvement often doesn't account for having a, a, an overarching vision that the continual improvement is all striving for. And that overarching vision can be really difficult to get to the right level of granularity. And so the second problem follows that, which is if our customer service team is continually improving certain processes and our warehouse and fulfillment team is improving certain processes and our sales team is improving certain processes and all of those improvements are affecting the central system, the architecture of the whole system, then they can inadvertently create more complexity in the organization um, also. So we absolutely do continual improvement, but we try to be super sensitive to not doing continual improvement on what we consider to be core processes, right? Which we don't want to foul up without some holistic view to um, what the impacts are gonna be. Um, and, um, and, and while we're doing continual improvement, we're also taking resources out of continual improvement to work on central, holistic, comprehensive change, which for our organization is <clears throat> at, an, at an annual scale or even at a quarterly scale, not every five years. Um, and so we end up needing to create this culture of agility that I referred to um, in, in my um, opening remarks. Joe, I'd like to bounce over to you. Um, you know, culture of agility, you know, I, I think you've been using software for a long time. What's your process of continual improvement, evaluating how the tools are working, if they're working to their fullest? Um, do you have somebody dedicated to that? Are you all kind of collaborating on that? What's your approach? Well, it's really um, democratic. You know, we, we try to have as much employee feedback as possible to see how tools are working. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about how happy your customers are, uh, how taken care of they feel, how good the communication is with them, um, how quickly their project is moving through the various deal stages, and um, sort of your, your net promoter score, really. I mean, if your net promoter score is going up because projects are being uh, processed faster, um, then that means you're doing something right. But I think Boaz just said it, that this industry is changing so fast that there's a new tool or 10 every quarter that you have to look at and evaluate. And we're doing that right now. Um, I think that the next horizon is O&M and there's a whole host of providers on the O&M side that we're doing our due diligence on right now. And it's difficult. Um, and for us, the only way to do that, <coughs> excuse me, is to do it democratically. Um, because if you try to make a decision top down, you're going to find that it's not going to take and unless you have the input from everybody in the organization that's gonna to touch that platform, um, it won't work. So that's really how we make decisions is we try to include as many people who are gonna use that platform as possible on the front end so they feel bought in when it's implemented. Joe, I'm, I'm really curious when you say democratically, are you literally talking about voting or how did, like, how did decisions actually get made in that process? Well, I'd say as collaboratively as possible. We don't. Sometimes we do vote. Um, we we have we actually have a new products channel in our Slack, where we will create a poll 
uh, after we've had the chance to hear everybody out, share all points of view, go through specification sheets, answer questions, and we'll straight up vote. Um, that's more on the hardware side. On the software side, it, I no, don't know that we've done a poll on a piece of software. Usually it is a decision made at the top, but with feedback from everyone who we know is going to use the system at some point. Um, and at the end of the day, it ends up being functionally democratic, even if we don't have a vote, uh, because people are bought in and they've had the chance to uh, have their voice heard. So more of a republic than a democracy. Sure. <laughs> Scott, um, I'd like to get your feedback. We're going to switch gears in a minute, but on this point of continual improvement, I think a lot of companies don't know how willing software developers and companies are willing to work with those companies one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, how do you approach um, training on the tool, uh, making sure the company is using it to its fullest extent, you know, getting the most out of Bodhi? And I'm assuming that you're also learning in that process as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. So I think it's um, really important that um, the software company themselves should be the one that's actually responsible for making sure that that company is getting the most out of the software. And so for us, um, uh, with all the our customers of Bodhi, our customers are they're assigned a customer success manager really kind of leads that onboarding process so that in that process that um, the customer success manager knows all the details about that company, who is involved, their processes, some of their um, nuances in their workflows and such. And then with after that, it's they're just constantly communicating with the users at that company on what's working, what's not, and um, also can communicate against uh, with new features that are being rolled out. But I think one of the key things is that for us as a company, we're specific in solar, and so we want to make a product that is better because if we make a better product, that means the solar companies are doing a better job, so more people are going solar, and we're only going to be able to do that with a lot of feedback. And so we're, we, we actually request and ask for feedback, and so that helps us kind of two ways. One is to first just to optimize the product as it is right now. You know, just usability is a really key thing. And then second as the business processes start to, to evolve for that company, as the energy landscape in general kind of start to change, we're also asking for feedback on what sort of new features need to be developed and incorporated into Bodhi. And so for example, there has been a really strong um, push to try to do more battery integration with what we currently have offer right now with Bodhi. And so we're definitely, that's on our roadmap and we're exploring ways to try to do that effectively. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd like to switch gears and mix it up a little bit. And we're going to try a little role playing and I'm going to put JW on the spot here. And he's, uh, he's happy to be our guinea pig, he said. Um, but, you know, I'd like to ask our solar experts, solar software experts here to put on their consultant hats. Um, and this can also be your sales hat, but each consultant can ask JW one short question about his business. And JW, you're going to pretend again like you, you haven't gone down this new software route that you are, are on now. And so each consultant can ask JW one question. Uh, Scott's going to go first and then Jan and Colton. And then if we have time, you can ask another quick follow-up. And then um, kind of make your pitch, you know, to, to JW about what your company can offer, you know. And I'm hoping that uh, the contractors on the call today can kind of hear what questions are going to be asked of them, can start to think about some of the, the things that they should be thinking about when, they, when it comes to solar software. So, Scott, um, did I say we'd start off with you? Yeah, Scott, why don't we start off with you? Uh, go ahead. Okay, cool. Awesome. So, JW, um, how do you currently, how do you manage the post-sale customer experience right now? And how is that process working out for you? I mean, right now we have a series of right now we have a series of emails that are going out kind of through our CRM, and um, there really is no kind of back and forth um, with them, which is one of the things that we kind of really are missing to be able to kind of collaborate or be able to um, talk back and forth with the customer as to kind of where they are within the process. But it it's definitely not where it should be. And so, okay, so with that, oh, are, hold on, hold on, you just get you just get one right now. Okay, yeah, we're, we'll have a follow up in a minute. Uh, Jan, why don't you take over? Take take the next question. 
JW, as a business owner, what is your, your greatest concern? What is it that you would like to see streamlined or automated so that your business can scale? Where do you think your difficulty is going to be there? I mean, really managing, uh, overarching, it's managing the customer's experience um, because that is you know, by far the most important part of this business. Now, we have to we have to handle operations correctly. We got to make sure that the installs are happening the way they need to be. But for us personally, we've got that dialed in. I mean, we do great work on the install side. We do great work on the sales side, just making sure that, that the customer experience is, is as great as it possibly can. And that's not just for us, that's for the solar industry in general, because I feel like the, the more happy people you have and the more people that are singing your praises and telling people about you, the better off it is for the industry to be able to attract more people. And for us here in Oklahoma, that's definitely the number one thing for us is we just want more people to see it, hear about it, and think about it. A healthy solar industry, wonderful. Uh, Colton, uh, your turn, one question, and you're unmuted too. Great questions. Those, those were all questions I was going to ask. But uh, um, JW, with your current cell structure, some of the things you're using, do you feel like it's currently agile able to grow and expand to new markets um, as far as scaling goes? Um, I, I, I think that it, that it is, um, you know, we, we do use kind of a centralized uh, software to be able to design and kind of go through the, the sales process. And, uh, you know, th that's fairly new for us up until about the last six months, because b before that, it was almost kind of the wild west. I mean, some of my guys were really kind of doing some stuff that, that I, I, I have no idea how or why they were getting to where they were getting. So having that, having that centralized uh, kind of thumb on the process is very important. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always interested to see kind of what's out there and what's coming and uh, kind of what the new technologies are. And so that's probably one of the, the aspects that I definitely keep my, my eye on the most is, you know, how, how can we best design and and I don't want to say sell because we don't take a sales approach. We 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 ask people to purchase from us um, because that's that's what's important to us is that we don't want to be looked at as salespeople. But you know, being able to communicate the, the advantages and what that means for them financially and uh, environmentally is is really important to us. Scott, let, let's go back to you. One quick follow-up and then, and then make your pitch on how your company can help uh, JW achieve his goals. Um, so with that, you had mentioned customer experience being a, and being a very important um, aspect. How does, I mean, why right now, how are you handling that and why do you think um, that needs to be, um, how do you think it can be further improved potentially with um, with digital help or with automation? Well, no, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, with, with automations and being able to engage in those customers, even when they're kind of stuck right in, in a particular silo, like maybe that process is a, is a two week process. And, you know, um, we've, we kind of talked about the, the Amazon approach of, you know, people always knowing kind of where they are and how quickly they're getting things. And so what I like about that approach is being able to engage with them even when nothing's happening, I mean, things are still happening, right? But they're not, they're not seeing or hearing from us or feeling it. So I like to be able to continually have them engage through a platform, whether it's an app or, or some other uh, means of them kind of seeing where they are kind of, it's like, it's like a waiting list, right? Uh, it's like a wait list at a restaurant. You can kind of see where you are within the, the, that wait list, which I think is important. Scott, I'm going to give you like 20 seconds to sell him on your on your product, well, I think Go that's ahead. actually real important. So, um, actually, we have sold to JW. Um, okay, he's, he's going to get launched um, real soon. Okay, done. Uh, eight seconds. Great job, uh, Jan. Twenty seconds. So, JW, the customer experience being the most important thing. Do you have any? Do people get lost if there's some complications or where are they, how are they doing with their customer experience once they're in your pipeline? Yeah, so we, we definitely did find that we were 
um, that we kind of had these buckets, right, or these silos in the processes that, that we were in. Our, we were managing our customer experience process through our CRM. And so depending on what status they were or what bucket they were in, you know, they, they could possibly get lost and, um, and not be engaged with as much as what we thought that they should be. So that's what was really important to me is to be able to set up those, those automations and those alerts to be able to notify not just the person on my team that's in charge of that, but also being able to notify their, uh, their higher up to be able to say, hey, look, there's something going on here that you need to pay attention to so that that way that customer feels like um, that we're moving them through the process as quickly as possible. And Jan, I believe you already sold your solution to, to JW, but we, maybe we, just give us the pitch. We have sold the solution to JW, and, and the pitch would be that, that we're going to proactively notify you and create this consistent experience for the customer so that accounting and sales, accounting, and project management are all working together in, in a coordinated way so the customer is getting regular feedback and a consistent experience across all your departments. Well, and, and Tom, I'd like to add just one thing there, just Please. about my kind of experience um, with Blue Banyan and Solar Success. I, I was not looking for the accounting solution that had CRM and, and operations integrated into it. And so I kind of found Blue Banyan almost by accident because I figured that it was going to be an operation software that that had CRM come in on one side and have accounting come in, in on the other side. But until I met with Solar Success and the folks over at Blue Banyan, I didn't realize that it really needed to be that accounting solution that, that tied the others into it. So that, that was that was kind of a mind shift for me because when I was at SBI looking for that solution, I wasn't looking for it in, in that manner. Right. It gets back to the hairball and the, and the, and the whole integrated solution effect. Colton, you want to follow up with, uh, with one question and then uh, give your pitch? Yes. Sorry, I was on mute. My uh, cat's having a little fun in the background here. Yeah. Um, so with your or a couple things that you mentioned about, you know, customer experience, super important. Um, you and your team are working more so, um, you know, selling yourselves and, and your company, which I think is really important. Um, do you see the value of your sales and presentation product focusing more so on um, customer information, maybe more of an educational or consultative experience versus a you know, flashy sales type setup? Oh, I mean, for sure. Um, we, we have taken a, a stance or, or a way of kind of handling our business as a consultative um, sales process. This is, uh, my, my salespeople are called solar advisors because I do not want them to be called sell people, salespeople. We do not talk about closes, we talk about purchases. And so kind of just building that culture of, being a consultant for these homeowners to give them the good, the bad, and the ugly, and be able to allow them to make the decisions. Solar's not right for everyone. Um, it, it, no. it can be right for everyone. But yeah, so for us, that consultive, um, giving them all of the information, building up all the scenarios that they can happen, or the things that might not work out the same way that, that somebody else might be kind of pitching them or proposing to them, uh, is important for us to make sure that the, that the that the potential customer has all the information. Colton, do you want twenty seconds to sell them on your product? Yeah, I think I'm I'm the only one out of the uh, loop with JW so far. So we'll see. Um, love your love your stance on. Oh, I'll get a few extra seconds. Love your stance on you know being more of a consultant. Um, broadcasting accurate information for those homeowners. That's really how we've structured our platform. It is a proposal tool, um, very great for sales, but we've really set it up for transparency so you can really present everything accurate across the board. Thanks, Colton. Thanks for everyone for participating. Um, and I do want to give Joe uh, an opportunity to weigh in. You know, after hearing all of that and, uh, you know, as a contractor yourselves, do you have a, a, a suggestion or a piece of advice you'd like to give JW um, in his solar uh, software infancy? Well, it sounds like we're using all the same stuff because we're also using Bodhi and Solar Success. Okay. Um, 
we uh, uh, we are using Solar Graph, uh, similar to Solo, uh, and it's worked well for us um, on the sales side. I'm not sure what JW is using on on the sales side, uh, and some people like to have their own tool. I think most uh, most of the companies we know we have an Excel tool that they like for their sales proposals, uh, which the advantage there is that you can customize it and you can change it every single day. Uh, Solar Graph uh, because they're actively upgrading the system constantly and it's a way to make a proposal in one to two minutes um, that is easily digestible by the customer. It shows a value proposition clearly. Um, so I'd, I'd love to know what, what you guys are using for your uh, sales proposals. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're using Aurora right now. Um, okay. we, we found that um, being able to not allow my people to manipulate it was really important to me. And, um, you know, and really that was just kind of who we were introduced to first. And we were using Aurora, then we went away from them, and we've just recently come back. Um, but in doing so, we've, we've been able to kind of tweak our processes a little bit. Yeah. One thing, one thing that we found is that, you know, Aurora is sort of like 80% design tool, 20% sales tool. And I think what we learned is that Solar Graph, and may, maybe it sounds like Solo is similar, is like 80% sales tool, 20% design tool. And it still is hard to manipulate the numbers in any third party software thing. Um, but I think what most residential customers care about is a value proposition and not necessarily having the absolute most precise uh, kilowatt hour generation uh, number. So that's worked really well for us. Um, and it is kind of a personal preference sort of a thing, but um, I think on the residential side, having something that looks good, that is m more of a sales tool and conveys the value proposition clear cleanly and clearly uh, is maybe more important than the technical side, in, our, in my opinion. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. That's great. One thing we haven't talked about is, 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 is money and spend and, and what, this, what this expected cost should be. Um, but before I mention that, I, I do want to tackle real quick our second trivia question. So this is what miraculous solar energy device was James Bond chasing after in this 1974 film? So name that film. And the answer is The Man with the Golden Gun, starring Roger Moore. So we got that. Great job on movie trivia. So let's talk a little bit uh, about um, costs right now. And we did get another question in the Q&A. Um, what is the expected spend for these sorts of things? JW, when, do, when, when you think about this from an operational standpoint or from a budgetary standpoint, um, what are you budgeting for? And if you don't want to share that, maybe think of, just walk us through the costs and what you're, what you're thinking about in terms of that. Yeah, so when I started looking at it, I really had no earthly idea what my budget should be. Um, I just knew that there was a better way to do it or there should be a better way to do it. And that um, kind of going through the efficiencies, it, Jan knows this. I mean, when we were making this decision, she met with every, every department that I had to make sure that it was going to kind of fit the way that we needed to because it was going to be um, a, a big price tag to be able to do it. But... I was able to quickly be able to kind of extrapolate the numbers and figure out that in the end, when we, when we get to the volume that I think that we're going to be at, it was going to be well worth um, the cost. So, um, you know, it's, it's based on a, on a per user, um, you know, basis. And so what I like about that is I can kind of figure that into my fixed costs um, and be able to project that um, pretty easily. That's great. Um, Jan, we're, we're, we're coming towards the top of the hour, but I wanted to ask you on the integration um, conversation, you know, the single side of true things, can you talk about the role of emerging standards and how they play into choosing software uh, and software solutions? Because I think there's a lot on the horizon that solar contractors should be aware of. Yes. Could, we, could I just give some statistics Please. for JW for a second? So everyone should kind of know that you should be spending um, one and a half to 2% of your revenue on solar and IT technology. That's just like the industry standard. So if you were a $10 million revenue company, that would be $200,000 a year that you should be thinking about as a rough budget for knowing that you are actually spending enough on your technology to be able to grow your business and keep up with the competition. And we do have some numbers 
about how this optimization actually works if people are interested. Sure, go ahead. Um, one of the numbers that came up is that we've got a 25 to, to 35% decrease in the length of time to get from contract to cash, where you've got your contract and you actually get the install in and you get the bulk of your money by having your process improvement. And then we've also shown that the continuous improvements are resulting in about $220 um, a project. It's about three cents a watt savings for overhead wages for people who are processing, you know, accounting and project management and that kind of thing. So if you're running 100 projects, that's $22,000 a month. So, you know, software costs are going to be a lot less than that. Mm -hmm. So Great. it's important to think about, but it's, it's going to get you there. There are some really exciting, so to transition, yes, there are some yes. really exciting things coming on for the solar industry as a whole. Um, we're working with the Department of Energy's Orange Button Initiative, which is doing data standardization across the industry. And what this is giving us is common terms so that we can um, send project information to each other with APIs in the same way. So by using this orange button compliant database, data structure, we've been able to integrate with Bodhi um, and with, with an orange button integration and then use that same model to integrate with gettheferral.com, which has got a different source of lead generation. And then Enterflow, which has got a different sales tool. And so by, by using the orange button compliance, we've been able to integrate with multiple other tools you know, relatively quickly. And I presume that, that these guys are gonna be able to integrate with other tools as well. So the one's the data structure for how to set up this interoperability more quickly across the industry. And the second is the data itself. So we're looking at, SunSpec is hosting an AHJ registry that is going to be utilized by the SEIA's solar app, as well as all solar success customers and Bodhi and Aurora um, are all interested in sending in an address for their street address for where they're at and getting the relevant AHJ back. And from a user's point of view, it's, it's much easier because you just enter the address and you get the right AHJ. So it's, there is no actual time there to do that. But from an industry-wide status, just by getting, knowing which AHJ you're in, that's the first step. But then Solar App is gonna take it to the next level and say, how do you submit to these AHJs? What are their requirements? All the specifics about that it's going to get built up over the years so that what all of us need to interface with to, our, our, to work with our local governments correctly and easily and smoothly is going to get more and more automated. And the solar app is going to be using an orange button compliant API. So if you, if you get in there and start using that to begin with, the AHJ registry is going to be using orange button and solar app is going to be using orange button to submit to the permitting agencies. So I wanna, this, I wanna make we're quick... starting to talk to each other. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Travis. No, no. I just wanted to make a quick plug that, that we've um, partnered with the Rocky Mountain Institute to support the solar app program. We're super excited about it. When, when you think about the, the soft cost um, issue that the residential solar industry has, um, streamlining permitting is obviously a huge part of that. So, yeah, super exciting. I'm glad you brought that up, Jan. So it's it's really going to be wonderful, uh, you know. Eventually, it's going to be five years probably before it's wonderful. But <laughs> as, we, as we start to wrap up here, th thanks so much, Jan, for that context. I appreciate that, uh, Scott. To to put a to put a point on that for our contractor audiences, when they're choosing software, how important is it to think about APIs and the interoperability of these software systems, uh, future proofing as much as they can their choices. No, it's, ex it's extremely important these days. Like um, JW was saying at the very beginning, he was, you know, there's, there isn't one software tool that can do it all. And if it, many companies, any software that tries, they generally just don't do it well. And so being able to have software that can integrate from, with one, um, from one software to another allows a solar company really to be able to pick a software tool that is 
works for them with their, when I say works for them, it works, has the right functionality, it has the right um, price tag, and it has that ability to, for them to scale into that next phase. And so, and then what's great about that is as that business starts to change, you can then look to start to swap out particular pieces as your business evolves, as that industry evolves. So having that um, interoperability where data is flowing back and forth, having that single source of truth is key, but that also makes the this solar software stack a lot much a lot more useful for the solar industry because there's never going to be that holy grail of one side i mean one app that can do it all okay as we wrap up here i'd like to ask, ask each of our panelists to to give their one recommendation so given our conversation today or something that's top of mind but what's your one recommendation for those you know just getting started in the in the solar software space or maybe for those who are are more um you know, or already down that path. Um, maybe Jan, let's start with you. Like, what's the one thing you'd like folks to take away with from here today? We were joking about the mute button. The, the main takeaway that I would like everyone to know is that if we can create a, the experience of a single source of truth so that we have enough clarity to move forward, it gives us visibility to what the issues are and then we have levers that we can change the game and really move the outcomes to accelerate solar deployment, which is the outcome that, that we're holding top of mind. So right. let's work on getting that visibility and then that gives us the power. JW, single thought? So my single thought is just be willing to, to make the financial and the time commitment to be able to put it together in a, in a manner that allows you to, to be scalable. For us, um, we knew, we, we could see what was coming and we knew what we were getting ready to experience here in Oklahoma. And so we wanted to make sure that we were as agile as we could be. And I'm, I'm a numbers, I'm, and I'm an analytics guy. And so I have to be able to mine the numbers in any different way that I want. And so make the investment of money and time and, and get in a system that, that will expand with you. Appreciate it. Joe, your one thought? Choose your CRM very wisely um, because it's going to have implications for how it integrates with all these other systems. Um, if we, we use HubSpot as our CRM and we've been thrilled with them, uh, if we didn't have HubSpot, we might not be able to integrate with Solar Success in the way we wanted to. If we didn't have HubSpot, we wouldn't be able to uh, integrate with Bodhi in the way we wanted to or Scoop, uh, our site survey software, among another uh, whole host of other platforms. So when you're looking at your CRM, it's really the keystone of everything else you're going to do. Because if you want to have integration and not have the hairball, you have to choose your CRM very wisely and thoughtfully. Great. Scott, one thought? Yeah, sure. Here's one that's not really a top recommendation, but often gets overlooked. Um, so when evaluating a new software, just make sure that it's been engineered from day one to handle the volume as your company scales. So ask the questions, does it work equally well for one user as well as a million users? Um, for example, does it rely on services like Zapier or IFTT, which can have scaling limitations? So that's really key. Um, another key aspect to during the evaluation. Awesome. Before we hand it back to Boaz and say goodbye to everyone, we did get one question, um, both in advance and it came up again today, but real quick, uh, discuss the role of drones and site surveys in O&M. And uh, Joe and JW, can you give me 30 seconds if either of you use these uh, systems and your thoughts? I'll, Joe I'll first, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, if, if I turn on a drone, the FBI knocks on my door. So uh, I can't do that. <laughs> <Joe's> <laughs> <It'll uncle. laughs> it literally will not take off. Um, but that's okay because uh, we use Eagle View. So for every project we sell, uh, for 40 bucks, we get an Eagle View Explorer uh, uh, file, uh, XML file that integrates with our CAD. And it gives us really, as far as I can tell, everything that we would get from flying a drone over somebody's house. And we don't have to go out to their house and fly a drone over their house. We can just order a file for 40 bucks and it gives us the CAD information we need. It gives us all kinds of other details.
obstructions. So I would recommend that if you're looking into drones because it's a lot easier to implement than um, getting a drone license and working with the FAA and buying a drone. Um, that's been our experience. Okay. Colton, I'd actually, I'm going to, I'm going to cut you off. I appreciate uh, in advance your thought, but um, I'd like to go to Colton and get his one final thought and then hand it off to Boaz because we're almost at the top of the hour. Thanks, Tom and everybody yep. else. Um, something that's been echoed by everybody, I think is agility um, and connectivity. When you're really looking at different software solutions, um, it's, it's, definitely key that that group that you're going to work with can be agile, um, has their own development team, is willing and already has integration set up with, with other softwares and other groups. So that way you're not going to get down the road with this group and then outgrow them. Um, so that's definitely a key part. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Colton. And thanks to all of our guests today. We really appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts with our solar community. Uh, we had Joe Marhamati from Ipsen. Uh, we had J.W. Peters, president of Solar Power of Oklahoma. Uh, we had Scott Wynn from the CEO of 17 Terawatts and their solar software product Bodhi. Jan Rippengale uh, of Blue Banyan and their product Solar Success. And Colton Maines, the director of strategic partnerships for Solo. Thank you very much for coming on. And Boaz, I'm going to hand it over to you for the last word. Thanks for coming as usual, and uh, see you all in a few weeks. Cool. Thank you, Tom. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to um, mention trivia question number three. There's a unit of length called the astronomical unit, which is equivalent to the distance between planet Earth and what object in space? And the answer is the sun. Thank you for remembering, Jessica. Um, I think this discussion is essentially impossible to wrap up. I think it's, it, it's by, by nature uh, evolving, kind of unfurling conversation. Um, so I think what I want to say is if, if any solar contractor is in the process of thinking about their own digital transformation, um, I think a really important piece of that is talking to a variety of external and internal, but external stakeholders. Um, we have folks at Bewa RE who are happy to talk to you about your approach. Anybody on um, this solar town hall, I'm sure would be happy to talk to you as well. Um, and ensure that you're kind of busting up your, your preconceptions about how to approach digital transformation and um, coming into it open-minded with a view towards um, what developments over the next number of years do you want to be prepared for and how do you set your organization up for that not just your software choices so um yeah that's what i've got i i want to echo um tom uh what a great panel joe jw jan colton scott thank you so much for joining us today um, i'm excited to see what snippets come out um thanks again to our attendees and uh look forward to um seeing you all in a couple of weeks thank you